Here is an ITT model Hi-Fi 9540 amplifier. I found this at the dump and before anybody diagnoses me with some sort of a messy problem, if I had seen the front of this at the dump, I would not have gotten it. These membrane push buttons certainly looked quite cool when this was new back in 1984, but they definitely didn't stand the test of time. The material has badly discolored. This is actually supposed to be the same color as this, a sort of a golden champagne color. It's absolutely disgusting to touch and it's cracked. So this is really not a very nice amplifier anymore. So I thought we're just gonna tear this apart see how it works and maybe I can make something new based on components out of this amplifier. Let's first find out if this thing still works. Let me apply power, turn this on, and nothing exciting has happened. So let's check for the presence of DC at the speaker outputs. I'm going to activate speakers B. We're going to see if there is any DC present on those outputs. Let's see. Oh, that looks very good. Zero. And over here, well, that's a bit more than zero, but it ought to be fine. I now have the amplifier connected to the CD player and the test speakers. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Okay, start the CD player. Actually, no. Where is the aux input? I think it's here. It's hard to read. Yep, okay. And we have audio. Volume control works. But as I shift the balance towards the left channel, there is no more audio. So there is only audio in the right channel. And of course, in the left channel, we just measured exactly zero volts at the speaker outputs. So I have a feeling there is something wrong. Here is a look down at the circuit board of the main amplifier. There is two speaker fuses on here. Just as expected, the fuse that belongs to the right channel, the working channel, is fine. But if I measure the fuse for the left channel, the silent channel, no conductivity. I have now replaced the fuse for scientific purposes. Speakers have been detached. Let's turn on the amplifier. There we go. Activate speakers B and repeat our measurement. What? 76. Yeah, that is still like 64 millivolts. 76 millivolts. So the left channel is fine. I would have expected to find the supply voltage present on the speaker outputs. That's a 3.15 ampere fuse. How do you blow that without blowing the whole amplifier in the process? I'm surprised. Everything's been reconnected. Let's apply power and see what happens. Well, no speaker protection. Had some nice pop. And the pop came from both channels. Let's start the CD player. Actually, no, where? There. Well, turns out the main amplifier does work after all. Interesting. 
So it turns out this amplifier is not entirely useless, but this right here is still very much broken. And I know there will be countless suggestions in the comments what I can do to replace this membrane. And I know I could replace this membrane, no problem with that. But in the end, I would still be stuck with a stupid push-button volume control. And as you may or may not know, I absolutely hate push-button volume control. So this is going away. However, it would be a waste to throw out this main amplifier. This is rated 45 watts RMS per channel. So it's pretty good. Now, thankfully, this amplifier is a fairly modular design. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and isolate this main amplifier and use it as a standalone power amplifier. And all this nonsense right here is going away. Here is the back of the amplifier. Power cord is over here. Voltage selector only lets you select between 120 and 220 volts. Two speaker outputs. Over here are the inputs. The tape 2 is only available as a DIN jack. And then there is this, auto function. Now this does not have a remote control, so my guess is that auto function was something fairly simple, like if you press play on the tape, it would send out a signal and the amplifier would automatically switch to the tape input, something like that. So this entire section, of course, is associated to the rubbish preamplifier. So all of this is going to come out. Here are all the boards associated to the inputs. We have the inputs themselves right there, obviously. Power comes in right there. Apparently the voltage is too high, so there is a dropping resistor. This is the phono input and the dual operational amplifier for the phono preamplifier is right next to that. This is an analog multiplexing IC. This is basically the input selector switch, except it is digitally controlled. And it turns out I was right. This auto function board connects straight to this multiplexing IC. So the devices connected to this obviously had the ability to either send out an impulse or a constant voltage that would change the input on the amplifier. Now, then there is this up here, which looks like an afterthought. I'm not entirely sure what it's good for. I think what it does is it provides a delay so that the audio in the moment of turning on the amplifier is muted. Here is the equalizer board. Power comes in right here. There are more dropping resistors. This is the audio input. There is a dual operational amplifier. That's just a buffer amplifier. And then it gets really interesting. Now, this up here is not the equalizer. These are just five potentiometers that form five voltage dividers, sending out five control voltages. The equalizer is this, an STK6328A. This is not an IC. This is what is called a hybrid circuit, meaning there are ICs in there, minus their package, which makes them a lot smaller. In this case, there are operational amplifiers in there. But then larger components, such as high-value resistors and capacitors, are printed onto the ceramic substrate that this is based on. And as we turn this around, you can actually see where all the components are located by the bumps in the paint. Now, what this is, there are 10 voltage-controlled filters in there. Now, the filter frequencies are controlled by these 10 capacitors, five for each channel. 
and then whether these voltage controlled filters cut or boost is controlled using these potentiometers, using those control voltages. And then over here we finally have the audio output. This circuit board is still partially connected to the amplifier. I can't take it out right now. This serves a bunch of different functions. Voltage comes in right there, goes through more dropping resistors. This board takes in the signal from the input board and puts it into this volume control IC. This volume control IC works together with this dual operational amplifier somehow. I'm not entirely sure. This may have something to do with also using this volume control IC for the balance control because there is no separate IC for that. There is a mono stereo selector switch and then this board sends the signal out to the equalizer board. It also takes the signal from the equalizer board back in and there is a linear switch that bypasses the equalizer. And then it sends the signal out to the main amplifier, but it doesn't stop there. The main amplifier sends the speaker signal back over here into this mess and then right here are the speaker selector switches. And via these two resistors over there, down here, the headphone jack connects to this board. And then, of course, the speaker signal is sent out to the connectors in the back. Now, normally, when you're designing an amplifier, you're trying to keep the input signal away from the speaker output signal. So, yeah, this is a bit of a weird design. But... It gets even more complicated. This is the brain of the amplifier. This is the microcontroller. This controls the volume control IC with the buttons for volume and balance on the front. It controls all the LEDs that this amplifier has. However, it does not control the input selector IC on the back. That is controlled directly via the buttons on the front. One nice touch is this amplifier does not seem to forget the volume setting that you had when you turned the amplifier off. There is this supercapacitor that acts as a backup power supply for the memory in this chip. This is a 5.5 volt 47 millifarad capacitor. 47 millifarads is 47,000 microfarads. So that's going to save the volume setting for quite a while, I guess. Here is the main amplifier board that also contains the power supply. The signal comes in right there, goes into these two driver ICs, and then into these discrete output stages. These four diodes and the two capacitors, both 4700 microfarads at 50 volts, are the power supply for the main amplifier. And then up here we have two voltage regulators for a symmetric plus and minus 19 volts supply to all of the rest of the amplifier circuit. Right here we have the board for the speaker outputs. There is just the connectors and some filter networks on there. This right here is the transformer and this is a slimline amplifier and this is a very slimline transformer. Quite interesting. And then, last but not least, on this board we have the primary and secondary fuses. Here is the faceplate, and on the back of the faceplate there are two circuit boards. The first board just contains the momentary push buttons for the input selector, balance control, volume control, and mute function. The second board contains all the LEDs. Little correction, the input indicator LEDs are controlled directly 
by the input switching IC. All the other LEDs are controlled by the microcontroller. And because the outputs of the microcontroller are directly connected to this board, we have all these little buffers along here. There is another one up there. These kind of look like transistors, but they are more than just that. And that's it. That's how the ITT amplifier used to work. I have now turned this amplifier into a pile of electronics. But don't worry, that's not where the video ends. In the next part, I will turn this pile of electronics back into an amplifier. Until then, thank you for watching.